resume our discussion, our talks, and stand now for this uh, round table. Um, sound diplomacy is about practices, first of all, and um, we decided to have practitioners with us, um, and we have this uh, impressive lineup of practitioners. Uh, we'll introduce them briefly. Um, Madame Elisabeth uh, Claverie de Saint Martin, you are President Director General of CIRAD, French Agricultural Research Center for International Development. Uh, Professor Norbert Unkudu, you are uh, coordinate, sorry, uh, you are Professor of Mathematics and Physics at the University of Abome Kalavi, Benin Republic, and also President of the Network of African Science Academies. Uh, we have Peter McGrath online. Can we connect with Peter McGrath? Not, not yet. I, I am here. Um, I don't know if you can hear me, but I'm Are not able here? to turn on the video. There is no, there is no video. Peter McGrath is coordinator of the Science Policy Science Diplomacy programs at the World Academy of Sciences, EWAS and coordinator of the Inter-Academy Partnership. We have Dr. Jan Marco Muller, coordinator for science diplomacy and multilateral relations of Director General Research and Innovation, European Commission. And uh, Mrs. Angela Schindler Daniels, head of the Brussels representation of DLR Project Management Agency, German Aerospace Center. And you have co-chaired the EU Sun Diplomacy Alliance uh, from July to December of last, of last year. Yes. So uh, I introduced uh, you uh, very briefly, I'm just limiting myself to, to, to tell about your present uh, position, but each of you has a uh, rich and uh, diverse uh, experience, professional experience, and this is exactly why we invited you Today, so I would like to ask you to introduce yourself more extensively and to put your uh, professional uh, experience into perspective. I would like to ask you how you got involved in sound diplomacy, what has been so far your personal engagement in sound diplomacy, and this question includes maybe another one. Um, we have been speaking of science diplomacy for maybe 15 years now or so, uh, but more recently, more recently, um, the wording science diplomat started to circulate in order to, to name those actors of science diplomacy that would be actors par excellence of science diplomacy. So maybe in my question about um, your engagement in science diplomacy, I would add another question. Do you consider yourself uh, a science, uh, a science diplomat? So um, let's start with you. Why not? <laughs> um, you work from for the German Aerospace Center, but I understand that your responsibilities uh, go far beyond research and space uh, issues, uh, and would, you will explain to us this. Could you please? explain how this gets uh, into the framing of sound diplomacy. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you very much. Um, actually, in um, the work we do at the Project Management Agency, we do everything but space. Um, so, <laughs> so, to, to, so that needs to, to be clear, the Project Management Agency um, is responsible for um, administering research uh, programs for the, in the national context on the one hand, but we also host a large number of um, national contact points for the um, framework programs and um, this is basically where my role came in because I, I joined the uh, project management agency um, 2000 and 2001 I started working as a national contact point and at the same time as a program delegate to the program committee uh, responsible for the social science aspects of the of FP5 at the time and um, then went out to be a delegate during FP6 
and then back again to a national expert for the rest of the uh, programs. And in this capacity, of course, um, we, I think, uh, with, with a little reflection, can say that we work in a, in a diplomatic way. Uh, once again, referring to the discussion we had uh, this morning, and when does diplomacy start? Does it start at EU level? I think it, I would say it does. So we are, because we were uh, promoting national science interests in the context of the, um, the, the work programs, but I think it goes further than that, because to be successful, you have to basically engage a bit like a diplomat, you have to have, you have to have alliances, you have to, because um, if one country wants, wants to put one issue forward, it's not going to work. Um, so you have to make sure that you, you work within the context of alliances, and you have to develop these and see what other countries have the same research interests as you do. And um, how then can you go and bring forward these issues? Um, can you give examples of such a lot? Yes, I mean, um, I think the, the best example with the largest impact uh, for those of you who are familiar with, with the, the uh, different framework programs, um, at the end of FP6, there was a, a great discussion that there should not be a program for social sciences in the next in Horizon 2020. And um, there was um, a combined effort, uh, not only from the program committee, but also from the NCP network that, that I was coordinating to reach out um, to the stakeholders. We had an open letter that was signed by 27,000 uh, people worldwide saying we need a, an adequate program for, um, for social science and humanities research, which then, by the way, in turn, turned to be the program where these three projects were also funded. So um, this was an, an initiative that we never could have done alone. Um, but I think we can say that, that Germany played a, a, a major role in it. We had a minister at the time who was very much committed to, to humanities and social sciences. So we took the lead. Uh, because the commission had no interest in uh, offering a uh, SSH dedicated program. I, we can argue whether Channel 6 was, was, was a dedicated program, but it had substantial SSH approaches in it. So I think this was an activity that I, uh, from my personal point of view, would definitely say was a science diplomacy action. Would you go uh, as far as saying that you are a science diplomat? When doing so, <laughs> well, if you uh, use a more generous definition of diplomat, it's saying it is that it's maybe an, an, an ambassador for an, a project and issue. Um, I think then yes, of course, I was not working in the context of any foreign service, but um, yes, I think so. Um, we were looking out for uh, a very important, very vibrant research com uh, community, not only German, but globally, so um, yes. Okay, thank you. I'm turning to you now, uh, Jan Marco Müller. There are two strong dimensions in your, in your career, as far as I understand, research management and uh, scientific advice. Mm -hmm. And all of this mostly at the European level. So could you, um, could, could you give more details about um, your career? This well, I, I studied geography, Spanish and media sciences. And a professor back then said that with this combination, I'm never ever going to get a job. <laughs> and it uh, turns out that actually this combination was very useful in the past two years when I was a science and technology advisor in the European External Action Service, because obviously geographers and diplomats deal with the same subjects, that's planet Earth. And as a geographer, I'm both a natural and a social scientist, so I can liaise with all the different disciplines. Obviously, knowing, learning languages and cultures is always good when you deal with international relations. Parce on parle français, on ne peut pas faire de la diplomatie. And and obviously, media sciences help me in, in communications training because at the end of the day, what I do is to communicate and explain science to policymakers and diplomats. Um, now, obviously, back then this was never the plan that I would uh, work in science diplomacy. Uh, I did a PhD in, ge in geography. I worked as a researcher, then went more and more into, you know, as you said, um, research management, stakeholder relations, communications, especially in environmental science. 
uh, I joined the Joint Research Center of the European Commission, so got much more involved than in, the, in the policy support world, and um, then had a chance to, for three years, to manage the Office of the Chief Scientific Advisor at the European Commission, so really becoming a, a science advisor. And then the past five years, actually, I moved more and more from science advice to science diplomacy, which you could, in, at least in one aspect, regard as well, sci also science advice in the domain of uh, foreign and security policies. So in a way, science diplomacy is the last stage of wisdom. Um, but obviously, um, I, I don't, I would not call myself a science diplomat. You wouldn't. I've, I've worked the past two years as a scientist among diplomats, yes, but I would reserve the label diplomat to those who are pursuing or have pursued a diplomatic career, or at least who, are, who serve in a diplomatic posting, like a science advocate perhaps. But, but I wouldn't regard myself as a science diplomat. I'm, I'm curious about one thing. Um, you said that, that your background is in geography, but yeah. um, most of the chief scientist advisors in the world, um, maybe 35 or 40 of them, advising foreign ministries in different countries, most of them have a background in, in natural sciences, medicine, biology. So coming from social sciences, um, did it make, does it make a difference uh, calling you being trained in social sciences then becoming a science advisor? Um, definitely, definitely, I find it very helpful because at the end of the day, we are talking about people and people's decisions and, and they are driven by social context. Um, I found it very funny the first day when I started as a science advisor in external action service, I noticed that they had put the office of the advisor on science and technology next to the office of the advisor for religious affairs and faith. So, so that's going to be fun. Um, but in fact, with my office neighbor, I work, for instance, on issues such as vaccine hesitancy in Africa, where religious beliefs play an important role in the vaccine rollout. So, so this is very important to have this uh, social uh, science dimension as well. Okay, thank you. Let's, let's move, move on to, to you, uh, Norbert Unkulu. You are a mathematician by training. Uh, my question is, how did you move from mathematics to uh, science diplomacy? and uh, to chairing the network of African science academies more precisely. And um, I could read also on, on, on the website of your uh, network that uh, NASAC, the network, aspires to become the ideal science advisor and partner in the African continent. So could you comment on that from the African or the global south more generally perspective? Okay, thank you very much. Science diplomacy is very important in my position as a uh, president of the Network of African Science Academies. And before being a president of NASA, I was president of Benin National Academy of Science, Arts and Letters for six years. So I measured the, the importance of science diplomacy in my function. The network, the network of uh, African Science Academy bring together 28 uh, national academies in Africa. And it assists its member in making the voice of uh, African science heard in Af by African policy makers and by uh, policy makers uh, worldwide. NASA helps the foundation of new academies, assist them in capacity building, and it's helped them to meet constitutional criteria, which will accredit them to become NASA members. So in the process of finding new members, potential members, and founding new academies, the NASA president may facilitate between the relevant government ministers and the scientific community. And function as a science, a science diplomat. So, in discussion with government representatives, the president explained the role of the academy and the nature of the institutions and service they can bring to the government, to the uh, civil uh, society, and uh, any other uh, bodies in the society. So, it is uh, sometimes easier for foreigners to explain the role of a, a potential academy in our countries. And the president, the board members, 
as well as the executive director of NASA, of the network of uh, African Science Academy. They are both stakeholders in science. So it is very, very important in the context of grave events uh, taking place in the world to explain the role of science. Science and scientists must be enabled to function without frontiers. So the president of NASA played this role in the pandemic and continues to play the same role. So it, it's all, it, his role is very important to negotiate with the policy makers, with uh, stakeholders in society and so on. Could you, could you tell us when the network started to work uh, and how many members National Academy do you have now? Now we have 28 national academies inside the NASA. Yeah. So, Okay, thank you. Then. <coughs> Elisabeth Clavry de Saint Martin, you, you started your career uh, in research before becoming a career diplomat and then moving to a prestigious research institute that you are uh, chairing and heading uh, now. So you, um, your career illustrates perfectly what is one of our major interest in this uh, insight project. Understanding the articulation between science and diplomacy through people, through individual engagement. Could you please uh, comment on that? So I will try. I, I don't like a lot speaking about myself, but I, I guess my career in a way can be useful. Uh, describing this career can be useful to, to embody what uh, science diplomacy can be. So I started my scientific career after graduating from what is now Ecole Normale Supérieure de Lusaké. And I was uh, specialized in microeconomics after having aggregation uh, economy and, and social sciences. And I happened to be appointed here in Paris Panthéon Sorbonne, just around the corner. I, I used to, to teach in one of the little rooms you could just have here. Then I, so I spent here three years. Then I was appointed as the director for uh, uh, the Department of Statistics in, in another uh, French university, which uh, is Paris Descartes. Now all these names have changed, but anyway, that was in the Department of Mathematics for uh, Social Sciences. And so I spent around five years uh, in the French university. Then I decided to present uh, Nina, which is now university. And I had a chance during my scholarship at Enna to be appointed during one year in 2000, that's quite a long time ago, in Brussels, in the permanent representation, the French permanent representation to the EU. That was a year of French presence 22 years ago. And it really, um, it really had an impact in my choice to become a career department. So at the end of ENA, I choose to enter KEDOPSI. I choose the diplomatic career. I've been appointed to Warsaw, to Brussels again, to Spain and to the US. Um, during all this time, I guess my, my academic background has been really a strength. It has been a strength when it came to the way I analyzed the situation, it made my comments more relevant, and I guess my analysis more rigorous. And then slowly I came, so I never stopped reading and, interest, and being interested in what was going on in the academic world. Then in 2013, I, I have been posted in Washington, D.C., in the French representation to the World Bank and the IMF. And then something happened. I discovered the word, the Economic International Organization, where the people uh, who are making diplomacy were all PhD. So they were all, I would say, science diplomacy. I mean, you have more than half of the staff of the World Bank and the IMF, which are not only PhD, but teacher and of publishing. For the people I had in front of me, it was really, uh, it became an asset to be a diplomat carrier 
having an academic background. So it changed a bit the way I was, I was looking at my career. And I said, well, I used to be the strange animal in the room, being in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I had a beautiful career, but in a way, my scientific background was something just for me. And at one point I said, no, this is something for the French diplomacy. That's interesting. Because in front of me, the people are just like me. I am in the club and that's useful for France. So uh, that was really a founding exper experience, if I can say. Then I came back to France in 2016. I was appointed de Deputy Director for Sustainable Development in the French Ministry for Affairs, for Foreign Affairs. And I was proposed to enter the CIRAD, which is an international center uh, of research uh, heading for cooperation and tropical agriculture. Uh, so it was in 2018, and I've been appointed CEO in, in uh, 2021. So at the end, I came back to research with a lot of pleasure. And I would not say that heading a scientific center is making science. Managing scientists is not making science, but it's coming back to research and its value. So um, this is the, my back and forth from science and diplomacy. I can stop and make it work. Um, your center introduces itself uh, as um, an actor of science diplomacy. That's what I could read. So um, the center, CIRAD, is an actor of science diplomacy and yourself, you are a science diplomat of a, a very specific uh, kind because of this uh, double culture, because of this uh, back and forth movement between knowledge, research and policy and science policy in, in this institution. Thank you. So thank you for uh, giving uh, more uh, insights about, about your, yourself and your career. Peter there. Um, sorry. Oh, <laughs> Peter McGrath. Yes. Um, how are you doing? I'm I'm fine, thank you. I I hope you can all hear me clearly. Okay, so um, you also have a kind of uh, unusual career. So as far as I understand, uh, you started in research and then you moved to journalism and then more to science policy and now. Uh, you are, as I mentioned in the beginning, at the TWAS. So uh, how do you connect in your daily work to science diplomacy? And by the way, are you also considering yourself a science diplomat? Um, well, well, let me start with that second question first, thank you. Um, I'm probably, I don't consider myself a science diplomat, but I would call myself a diplomatic scientist, or maybe a diplomatic science administrator more and more these days. Um, how I connect in, in my daily work um, with science diplomacy. Um, I, you'll have seen also from your introduction that I wear two hats with TWAS, um, the World Academy of Sciences, and IAP, the Inter-Academy Partnership. Um, with TWAS actually going back to 2000, 2011 was basically thrown in at the deep end by our sort of incoming director, Romain Morenzi. Um, he had been at the AAAS Center for Science Diplomacy before coming to TWAS. Um, and he was also sort of Minister of Science in Rwanda prior to that. And he came in with this idea that TWAS needed to have a, a science diplomacy program. Um, and he tasked me with getting that going and setting it up um, and at that time I, I had honestly never heard the, the two words put together in, in the same sentence so we were really sort of starting from scratch but um, I think we did a good job and I can talk a little bit more about that um, if we have time but um, certainly TWAS uh, like like CIRAD it was just mentioned is is a science diplomacy actor in that it you know reaches out to you know, governments and government agencies and has them working together. We're supported, supported by the government of Italy, for example, through, through UNESCO. Um, we re receive strong support from CEDA in Sweden. Um, but we're also entering into agreements with, you know, um, government agencies 
in different countries in the south, in South Africa, Malaysia, India, and, and elsewhere. So TWAS itself has been a science diplomacy actor for many years, even before it, it started its science diplomacy program. Um, IAP, um, the Global Network of Science Academies, its sort of main reason for being is the distilling the latest science, if you like, and presenting that with policy recommendations um, to, to policy makers, you know, trying to foresee, if you like, the, the issues that are emerging from science that policymakers need to start to think about and, and so on and so on. Um, Norbert has de described NASAC um, and IAP, if you like, can be looked upon as a global version of NASAC. Um, uh, NASAC is actually one of our four regional networks. We have others in Europe, the Asia Pacific and the America regions. So IAP is acting with the academies in all those regions, trying to get them to work regionally and globally and um, present analyzing the you know scientific evidence for policymakers um just to mention one critical issue we've just published a report on and there's outgoing ongoing dissemination is on the issue of climate change and health um to you know topics that have not necessarily been regarded in in the same um lens but but you know there is a lot of interactions between the two that need to be considered as as we move forward Okay, thank you. We will, we will go deeper in this through the, the following question. After introducing yourself, uh, maybe we could focus on one of the challenges of science diplomacy. There are so many challenges, but we decided to select just one. Uh, you know that we organize in our inside project uh, science diplomacy schools. And I could pick up in one of the conclusion of the schools uh, this uh, question, recommendation. We need improved coordination among actors, both junior and senior, that are involved in science diplomacy. Coordination between actors. So uh, this is the point I would like to ask you uh, to talk about. Um, dialogue, um, way of um, doing a kind of co-construction of decisions, initiatives, involving scientific uh, input and diplomatic uh, resources as well. So uh, this is the point we could try to uh, go deeper in. Uh, Elisabeth Clavry de Saint-Martin. Uh, but before that you get into this question, I would have also maybe a more specific question to you. Um, as you are a career diplomat, um, could, could you tell us a little bit what, uh, what is the importance uh, of uh, science and technology uh, teaching or uh, how to say that? Um, introduction to science and technology issues in, in the training of career diplomats. Um, is it something uh, which is uh, considered important, probably uh, improving over time? But uh, how could you uh, give you also a kind of answer to this question? I will be honest. <laughs> um, the scientific culture of French diplomats is, is quite low. And, um, <laughs> It used to be higher because we used to have more diverse people inside the ministry. When I entered the ministry 25 years ago, uh, nearly 25 years ago, um, I used to have colleagues uh, who were engineer, mathematicians, physicians, um, often from the highest school, polytechnique, and so on. And they they had chosen to go to the ministry, and 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 they succeeded. And you have a lot if you if you can see our ambassador in Washington is a mathematician. Uh, our permanent representative represented in Brussels is an engineer. And I you have a long list of them, and I've, I know them, I've been trained by them. Today, the young people entering the ministry, the ministry are much more human sciences um, trained and this is, this is not a problem per se, but this is a problem when you have to deal with a huge variety of problems. If I, if I turn to, for instance, on biodiversity and climate change, 
if you don't have someone who understands a bit some physics, some biology, you have a problem in a way that you can um, design solution and think about what is feasible and not feasible. As it is a problem, the French Minister of Foreign Affairs has decided to have people coming from short-term missions on contract to help. But it should be more useful, it, it should be really desirable to have people with regular scientific training so that they know the latest discoveries and what we are dealing with. <laughs> okay. No, but, yeah. what about you? What about um, initiatives that uh, are taken in your academies in your network regarding uh, improvement, improvement of knowledge about uh, international relations, diplomacy, or whatever, of uh, scientists? Yeah, it is, you know, it is a very important question that you are asking now. And there is a lack of uh, skills in science diplomacy in Africa. And uh, one of critical uh, elements is how to establish clear, a clear communication between uh, uh, scientists, diplomats, uh, stakeholders, and civil actors. Mm -hmm. And for that, there are many obstacles. Language of staff, uh, the lack of adequate pedagogy, uh, the virtual absence of uh, scientific literacy uh, among our policymakers, and the level of understanding of scientists of political processes. So there are a lot of obstacles that we need to overcome, that we need to establish bridge uh, between. Uh, all these actors. So, for example, there are very few uh, scientists in the parliament, in the government in Africa. And uh, the scientific interest of our policy makers is also too weak. And uh, mostly scientists who worked in the government as uh, advisors of the ministers or in the parliament. They don't have free hands to, to advise correctly uh, policymakers. And uh, the fact that policymakers do not have clear understanding even of the aim of the government of, uh, about the strategy, uh, development strategies of countries, this constitutes a, an obstacle uh, to explain them. Uh, what science can bring, bring to, 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 to the policy makers, what science can do for the development of country and so on. So I think we need to establish a kind of short workshop between scientists and uh, poly, uh, diplomats, uh, and perhaps to introduce a basic science literacy, basic science knowledge in the training, in the formation of diplomats, and vice versa. For scientists, in particular, for those who are members of academies, because our main mission is to advise the, the government, the policy makers, and the civil, the civil actors. So we need also to have skills in diplomacy. So short curves for uh, members of our academies, I mean seniors and young members, are very uh, important. Now, I know uh, with IEP and the World Academy of Science, there are some initiatives to bring together members of academies and give them uh, short courses on science diplomacy. But it's not enough because each region has its own concerns, and it will be very important to bring together, for example, the, the academies in the same region uh, face the, the common objective and to analyze with them how best, how to communicate the best 
with the policy makers, with different actors for the development of the, the, the region and to face the important the challenges we faced in, in the regions. In this kind of workshop you are speaking about is probably an initiative that you could can push forward yeah, as a leader of those, of course, those to academies. To permanent exchange, exchanges with diplomats, scientists and diplomats, to put them at least twice a year together to discuss about the challenges, about uh, the tasks in front of them for the development to, 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 to solve the, the major the critical issues in our a contemporary society, society is facing. I will turn to you again, uh, Peter McGrath. Uh, TWAS is a kind of bridge between the north and the south. We were speaking about problems more specific to, to go to the south now. And uh, uh, as a science diplomacy coordinator, uh, you uh, organized uh, teaching, training, <laughs> workshop, things like that, uh, <laughs> relating to the um, improvement of skills, capacities. Um, what, what is your experience on that? What are your major achievements and what could be improved as well in, in your activity? Um, thanks, thanks for the question. Yes, we, we started our training courses in, in 2014 when there were maybe one or two around. AAAS, of course, had been doing some in Washington. But with TWAS, we were the first ones really to open up training in science diplomacy to scientists in the global south. Um, and I, I think we made a good start a few years. And we, at one point, actually, if you search science diplomacy on Google, TWAS was placed above AAAS. So I, I take some credit, credit in that. Um, but also the you know the term and the practice and the the wanting to learn more about science diplomacy i think spawned a lot of spin-off courses spin-off institutions giving science diplomacy workshops and training and there were a number of these around that have, that have grown up um, i can think off the top of my head barcelona sao paulo and in india too uh, and others um so how does TWAS stay ahead of the curve, if you like? What, what makes us, us special? We, we still have that focus on the, the developing world. Um, and what we've done now is something that Norbert was alluding to, sort of, we profited a little bit from the, the COVID pandemic because we were unable to hold in-person meetings. We decided to expand the number of participants that we could have online because it was so much cheaper to do this. Um, and instead of having one participant per country, we went for what we call participant pairs. So the, the applicants was actually two people, one young scientist and one policymaker from mostly from the same country, but not, and it's not a, a hard and fast criteria. And the idea was that these people had been paired by their institutions so that there was an institutional buy-in. So we're not just training a young scientist who goes away and think, oh, thank you for the training. Now, what do I do? Who do I talk to? But he also, he or she has already made those connections. And we hope that this pairing will lead to more institutional engagement you know, as the, the months and years roll on. Um, we're just having in later this year and a couple of months that the second edition of this pairing and we're bringing back some of the participant pairs from last year to talk about their experiences 12 months on but we're hopeful that this is a, a good model that will again sort of keep twas ahead of the curve a little bit and for those sessions or training sessions that you are organizing could you tell us about uh, the importance of the demand um, do you have many applicants? Do you have to refuse some of them because not, not capacity we, enough to get them into your classes or? Uh, ab them? Absolutely, absolutely. We get, um, let's say, uh, um, certainly more than double the number of applicants we can take 
because of this pairing, it's a little more difficult to build your application. I mean, in the past, we were having, I don't know, 500 applicants for 30 positions on, on a course. Um, so very, very competitive for the young scientists to get in. Um, and I would just say, over the years, one thing we've also deliberately tried to do is bring in more diverse speakers and lecturers, presenters, uh, and especially from the global south to, to bring the case studies that are relevant to the, the scientists that we're, we're presenting to, that we're, we're trying to teach. So I think if you look back at the agenda for our very first workshop in 2014, uh, probably 90% of the, the presenters were from the USA or Europe. Um, we're getting that down to certainly less than 50% now. So we're and um, we're increasing the diversity of the perspectives that we're bringing into these courses too. Very interesting. Thank you, Peter. Moving back to the North Angela, I may ask you. Um, uh, from your experience, oh, um, thank you. what, how do you, how would you assess the quality of the dialogue between, in your experience, those who are on the scientific part, on the research part, of, uh, of, of this activity and those who have to make decisions or policy decisions, understanding is understanding um, fluid between those two, uh, I would say families of policy makers and um, those who uh, apply to such programs, those who want to get funding and maybe do not understand sometimes why they are not funded as they would like to. I think it's still a major challenge. Um, a lot of terms would come into my mind. Fluid would not be one of them. In the context of the dialogue, um, I think there are exceptions, of course, um, and there's been progress made, but from, um, especially in the context of, of um, EU funded projects that um, have as a criteria, basically, to have the, the policy connect to uh, show in its impact uh, part, how it links up to different uh, EU policies. It's, um, it's, it's very difficult to convince uh, researchers that this is, this is really an important part of their application and not something you do at the last minute and take 10 minutes to do um, because it needs to be thought through. Um, and Finding the right, I mean, it's also about finding the, the right partner for a dialogue. So you have to see how to correct, connect correctly for your, your area of research to the overall policy context. Um, and I think as um, our situation is getting more complex, as also the EU research um, challenges are getting more complex, finding these, these partners is not easier. So I think this is something that needs to be facilitated. So um, I think we still have a lot of um, a, a lot of issues that need to be be uh, in the context of communication that have to be honed. Um, I think we have a bit to go, and I think there's still um, at least I can say this for particularly for the German research community. I think there's a, quite a bit of reluctance to get involved. In, in policy um, processes. So I think there's a um, reluctance on both sides. So I think we, there's still uh, a need for, um, also for research on this is issue, but also for, for facilitators to make this happen. And those tools are not available now. Initiatives, are there initiatives taken in order to, to, to close the bridge? Well, we have more. the alliance. We hope to. <laughs> yes, well, of course we, we have the alliance. But I mean, at the, the level of your um, work. I, I think there are. Um, I, I think it's something that that's in progress. I, I don't claim to have an overview of all the initiatives going on. So I think there there are initiatives out there, but the the. the uh, situation we're looking at the context is a, is a very vast and multi-layered context we're talking about engaging citizens we're, we're talking about engaging different stakeholders so these are all 
issues that need to be considered in this, this equation. So um, I, yes, I think we're still working on finding a good concept to making this um, easier for both sides. Yeah. Actually, it's more than, than just two sides, so. Thank you. Uh, and you, Jan Marco, I understand that you are the commission, uh, among other things, in charge of improving the dialogue between civil servants of the commission, those who make decisions, prepare their decisions, and the interests of science and technology, the standing of science and technology. So how do you manage to, to have this dialogue, this understanding of science and technology issues that are taken into account? I can perhaps tell a bit about my experiences in the past two years as a science advisor and external action service. And I always felt that the big Achilles heel of science diplomacy, that it is very much supply driven than demand driven. Uh, we, we always say, have all these fabulous things we do as scientists and the science advice we can provide and the bridge building and so on, but we need to work on the demand side. It's not a natural reflex of diplomats to ask a scientist. Um, and that's something we need, to, we need to trigger. But what I did when I was a science advisor there is basically to, I would say, undercover infiltrate the organization with science. Um, in many ways, sort of started it suddenly in the reading material of the diplomats, which they get, where they usually have these foreign policy think tank pieces, suddenly articles from Science, Nature and Lancet started to appear. Um, it went on um, with uh, having lectures about science, like, like Peter Gluckman, the, the president of the National Science Council, gave a lecture to the European External Lecture Service. Um, I um, also established a kind of, I identified, identified evidence champions in the organization, who I knew either had a scientific background or an interest in science or by the nature of the work, like the, the Arctic issues had to deal with science. So to use them as, as multipliers within the organization. Um, and of course, making sure that in the training sessions, like the, the pre-posting session before diplomats go abroad, to make sure that there's science diplomacy as part of the training program. Uh, and uh, one of the most important allies I found, to my surprise, was the communications department. Um, and that's not just because they appreciated my quick and immediate fact-checking service of their press releases, um, but also um, because I provided them with narratives they could use, like, like around vaccine activity and similar issues. And then they returned the favor by tweeting about women in STEM or uh, about letting me update or create uh, science diplomacy web pages and so on. And that was actually a very productive relationship I found. So it's very important to identify these, these multipliers that can kind of help because I, I'm just one person. I cannot, I cannot do everything. They have the multiplier that can kind of spread the word about, about science and technology. And obviously now for my, my new job as a, a, a uh, dealing with science diplomacy in, in DG research is about, of course, now we're developing the European science diplomacy agenda. And uh, that inevitably will be a joint exercise uh, involving all the, the, the community of, of scholars and practitioners to actually to come a, to come an understanding what do we want to achieve in Europe with science diplomacy. This expression that you use is quite interesting. Supply-driven supply versus demand-driven. Understand from what you said that uh, the presence of science in, in the mind of people in the European Commission is supply driven, but not demand driven. Am I right? Um, and maybe um, from that, would, would you say that maybe science diplomacy is more the concern of scientists than diplomats? Um, I think there is an increasing awareness among diplomats that they need to engage with the world of science and technology. And I think the the really the, the event that where they noticed it was, was the COVID-19 pandemic. When they noticed that when you want to manage a pandemic, it's not sufficient to talk to foreign policy think tanks, but actually you need to engage with quite some very weird disciplines from a diplomatic point of view. Um, and to get an understanding you know, of the dynamics of the pandemic and the latest mutations of the virus. And, and of course, many geopolitical issues that come into play here. And it's quite interesting, actually, also that another angle where it enters is, of course, the, the emerging technologies. It's artificial intelligence, it's quantum, etc., uh, which have the potential to impact the, the balance of power in the world. And that's uh, uh, where I see, actually, technology creeping up on the policy agenda and being discussed in the Foreign Affairs Council, for instance, 
and, and it's really important to, to get uh, to make sure that we are not discussing just science diplomacy in our community, in our circles, but actually make sure that it gets on the agenda of the diplomats. Thank you. Uh, would any of you in the panel have comments, want to make additional comments? Or please do, Peter, if you want to add something before we open to the, to the room for questions. Yes? Um, okay, I just comment on you on the supply side. Um, I think at least if we're talking about the, the, the um, EU um, research arena, I think this is something that was not, um, it, it wasn't um, an organic process because I think the, the commission gave very much, very strong impulses there to, to, to grow that supply because the connection between science and, and the policy was something that was, um, that came uh, top down. I don't, it, it was not uh, something that most of the researchers had a need to uh, accommodate it was something that was part of the evaluation process that the commission wanted. Mm. So I think that's part of, of creating the supply in any case. Perhaps just, just one, one point to add here, now putting my commission hat on, <laughs> is I think one of the, the great um, advances we've seen with, with inside, but also with two sister projects, is really not just to advance science diplomacy as, as a discipline in a way and the methodologies and all the rest of it, but also to really to create this, this community of scholars and practitioners, which we now see in the room here. No, I think mutual inclusivity is the way forward. And uh, African scientists need now to be at the policy and implementation table, uh, table now. And uh, in Africa, engagement with African Union is a priority for us as it unifies the effort in the face of crisis. So we need, we need to work, work hard to establish clear communication between uh, policy makers and scientists. That is my last Thank you. Any other comments you want to add something? Just to emphasize just what has been said by the previous speakers, uh, the first point is that if you just think about diplomats and scientists, you miss one point, and the point is politics and policy and decision makers. And the distance you have to these policy makers, which obviously is uh, shorter when it comes to diplomats, and more distant when it comes to scientists. And the second point, and I, I fully agree with you, uh, Jan Wackel is, is that COVID changed things. Because for the first time, they had to be at the same table to take decisions. Decision in, if we take the EU in our countries to see uh, the, um, to which other foreign countries we close the border, when we open, and it was both scientific, medical, and diplomatic decision. And they had to come to one common decision. And to this point, it was very interesting to have the scientific council uh, to the president of Akutik, uh, the, the, the COVID council, uh, which was really something very new. And they just had a meeting of European scientific COVID to the prime minister and president of the EU to discuss between them and to have a, 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 a learning a session of how they have dealt with the crisis to be scientific advisor to policy making in this crisis. And that's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, Peter, anything to add? Yes, thank you. Just uh, another example, if you like. Um, a, a few years ago, I had the, the fortune to be invited down to Rome. Um, I'm based in Trieste in Italy. Um, to present to an organization called ILA, the Ist Institute of Italian and Latin American Relations. So this is the network of the Latin American embassies in Rome. And so we had representatives from about 20 different embassies and learning for the first time really on science diplomacy. And 
one of one of the points I was trying to make was exactly this um, demand side, you know, that the scientists are there as resources for you, for for the embassies, for the ministries in their home countries and so on. And if they don't know where to go, which wasn't always clear to them, then the academies of science in those countries is a good first place to to knock on the door and make, make those connections. I mean, often the academies are supported by governments. Um, are able to act independently from governments and provide, you know, independent science advice. Um, but I think we need to encourage more governments to reach out to their national academies and build those bridges. It's, you know, the academies can only go so far knocking on the door of the ministries, but building that, that two-way connection, I think, and encouraging the, the ministries of science of environment of energy whatever it might be we know that science is involved in all these then, then that is uh, an important way to go okay thank you very much Peter. um now we, we have 10 to 15 minutes left for questions question that came online and question in the room so please Hello, uh, so my name is Karen Chiti. I'm uh, part of uh, Ixa Africa, so I have a question for Norbert. It is possible to work with us uh, by uh, maybe sharing some data if you are, um, that is, for example, the science attaché in Africa, or maybe we can work together uh, on, the, on the main access of science advice for governments, or maybe connection between the different um, academies. I know that some of them are part of the IAP network, but maybe we can also, through the ISA, um, make new, new, um, can tweak uh, new, uh, new projects on this, uh, on this direction. I'll be, I'm, I'm very sorry, it was, uh, sorry. Uh, it was very difficult to yes. understand this question. Okay. That is on. Yeah. Okay. I, I said today NASA could bring together 28 national science academies. Okay. You want exactly. You want me to cite the countries or what? The UK yeah. with science attaché is the embassy. Yeah, the embassy. Yeah, the yeah. science attaché. The NASA, the NASA includes uh, 28 academies, right? Yeah. Okay, my question is about um, do you know if uh, there are science attaches in, uh, in the African countries? Yeah, I know that some uh, national academies have. Uh, uh, advisors, science uh, advisors uh, at the presidency and also abroad in uh, different uh, embassies. For example, in Italy, uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Professor Pap Sek, is uh, an expert in agriculture and he's the embassy of uh, uh, Senegal in Italy. And he, uh, yeah, and he he is at the same time the main advisor of President Macky Sall, who is now the president of African Union. So, some examples exist. The communication was sorry. You're welcome. Hello. Um, my question is about uh, scientific diaspora, and I think that she mainly focused uh, about the uh, scientists in the Scientists are actually abroad. Uh, so I have 
question for you. Um, uh, do you have any programs that are integrating this scientific diaspora from Africa uh, so that the participants are in the, in the uh, scientific diplomacy of Africa? And if Europe, uh, let's say France or any other country, they put such a program for their scientific diaspora, uh, can you also advise how it can be promoted to Africa? Okay. It is a good question concerning both the diaspora and scientists in our countries. As diaspora, you are our amb ambassadors abroad. And today I know that there are many countries which are encourage uh, the diaspora to participate uh, in training in the universities, uh, in uh, of supervision of our cases and also representing the countries abroad. So I think there are, there are many efforts in, in that sense. May I also jump in on this question a moment? Yeah, so just to, uh, yeah. Just this idea of scientific diaspora um, for us has, has not been investigated quite, quite uh, you know, broadly. Um, we, we've sort of identified this as a, as a gap, but we are, as, as TWAS, in collaboration with SASTA, it's a, a network of sort of Arab um, scientists um, hosting a conference online in this coming September. The announcements will go out shortly, so please keep your eye on, on the TWAS website, and I'm sure we'll disseminate it to, to all the networks. Um, there will be an opportunity to submit um, ideas for session proposals and so on, but the, really we'll be discussing the scientific di diasporas, best practices, learning from each other, and all these aspects. So that, that's coming up this um, se September. Thank you. So there's one question here, and, uh, and then you. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Petr Kaiser. I'm a special member of the Science Diplomacy of the Czech Minister of Foreign Affairs. And I would like to thank uh, all these panelists for a terrific discussion. And I find it really interesting, and, uh, especially in the terms of, of what are the practicalities and challenges for science diplomacy nowadays. And uh, I would like to pick up on the point that was raised by Ian Marco, that uh, recently there were some big changes uh, in terms of uh, how diplomat science diplomacy works or should work. For example, COVID pandemics, you wanted to maybe address that. And I fully think of that, that this is a new kind of uh, exercise that we have to work to together. But at the same time, I believe that uh, there are some other new phenomena and challenges uh, that we should think of. And one of them, in my opinion, is uh, that we are living in an area where there is a, a massive assault of uh, various uh, fake news, alternative facts, and all these uh, narratives that actually undermine the authority of uh, uh, college based evidence and uh, scientific uh, uh, narratives. Uh, it is actually the main framework of. Uh, uh, for the scientists and for the diplomats and uh, policy makers that we should work together in this, in this challenge. So my point would be, if I would wonder whether the panelists would uh, care for the reply to that, whether they consider this uh, new challenge for uh, science-based evidence, for science-based policy being uh, under, I would say, attack from many regards. <laughs> This is something that would be a matter or anything that the should address. Yeah. I mean, definitely the, the whole issue of misinformation, disinformation, which we have discussed so far, obviously, is something which is very high on the agenda of foreign ministries. Uh, and not just because of the Russian invasion in Ukraine, but, but also beforehand already. Um, and, and I think this is actually one, one angle which actually should be one of the bridges where science and diplomacy can, can work together because we are in a way sitting at the same boat 
because science is is attacked because we have scientific institutions um you know there are some populists that see then the science painted science as being part of the establishment so to speak that needs to be overcome and and, and attacked by then by, by by populists um so there's an issue obviously for us as scientists that we want to defend of course scientific evidence and, and fact based um or the, the fan the, the policies that are that are based and formed by facts but it's the same issue where the diplomats themselves are also struggling with because they of course need to counter uh, counter these these narratives uh propaganda narratives be it from state actors or from non-state actors um undermining of course and then the, also the, the, the foreign policy narratives and, and i think that's definitely one area where i see um uh, potential for the future where science and diplomacy should work together yes uh, the very brief uh, two brief questions i think one of the topics you're talking about is mobility between silos silos of government academia business civil society etc I see those silos as very, very ossified. And in reality, I don't think those silos have any interest, any real interest, in the ability between them. So my first perhaps provocative question to you is, do you think that in those silos, government, foreign service, academia, etc., do you think there is a real interest in increasing mobility between those silos? And the second question is, we speak a lot about academies, but who do these academies actually represent? I'm a Danish national working in Norway. Neither Danish nor Norwegian Academy represent me in any way. We were in Lisbon earlier this year, and this is an absolutely beautiful Portuguese Academy. I was very surprised to learn that I think it has 100 plus members in a 10 million country uh, nation. So who do these academies actually represent? And I'm thinking in a Scandinavian country, if you want to reach researchers, we don't talk to the academy. We talk to, for example, the Norwegian Researchers Association to train them. Thank you. So who, who would take this, this question? Okay. That's a very complicated one. <laughs> um, your first question about the silos and whether there is interest to break them. Of course, there is not. There is not on each side because they have their own career and, and there is a strategy, there are selection, there are uh, ways of recognitions inside. Still, I think all governments converge that we cannot for instance, if you look at what is going on in France, we have ENAP, which is the high, uh, high civil servant school, which has been changed. In ENAP, we have a dedicated uh, exam for people with PhD, and there are, there are more and more positions of it. And what is more interesting, what you do when you're in school. When I used to do it, there was no scientific uh, courses in any kind of way. Right now, for instance, they have a special dedicated course on one health issue. That is interesting. That is new. And if you start uh, teaching, learning, people are all curious. And they will, they will try to think, oh my God, something is, it's interesting. This guy I just met, he's a scientist, but he can help me. And having more and more of these kinds of diverse uh, learning courses, curriculum, it can change the face because it will change with the people. It will change with the new diplomats, the young one, and with the new scientists. If they want to break silos, they will. But you have to give them the idea and you have to explain them that it is possible. Your second question, which is also very challenging, is about what academies are we presenting? This is a question that Sihat, for instance, we are Center for Research, and we have positions on some subject. For instance, if we take food security, which is a kind of political subject right now, we have a common line, a line which has been given in the press, which has been given to the government, a line which is our scientific analysis tell us that in this uh, zone of uh, the world there is a risk, 
etc. So, and some ends of solutions. But of course, each scientist inside CIHAR is completely free and most welcome to give it its advice. And it's the way research and science work and, and, and is successful by analyzing, contesting, adjusting. And this is the way it goes. Yes. Oh, perhaps just, just yes, very briefly on, on the silos. I would say 10 years ago, I would have agreed with you. Um, but I think uh, it's changing. I see it in the European Commission, almost everything is done horizontally now. And that's because the problems and the challenges are becoming more and more systemic. To solve any issue, you will need at least five ministries at the table nowadays, or 10 ministries at the table. Um, and that's what's happening. And that's, of course, governmental innovation that is happening as well. And we have, by the way, also seen it with, 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 with COVID. I mean, that was not just a scientific achievement to have within one year a vaccine against COVID. It was also the regulatory innovation that we have seen that agencies were much, much quicker than in the past to approve uh, vaccines. So I think this, these things are happening and I think the silos are being broken up, but uh, it's, it's still underway the process, but I, I think we have already kind of way. Yes, uh, thank you. We have between 50 and 70 persons following this afternoon, and we have a couple of questions from them, which I will uh, bring. One of them will be for Robert. Uh, speaking about sharing knowledge, uh, are there issues with open access across those national African boundaries? And I would like to ask the second question, which I think is general. It seems that many of you are describing an activity that aims to promote the use of science in policy making and science collaboration across borders, but not as a tool to build higher levels of diplomatic relations. Would you agree? Open science uh, is a task a great challenge in Africa. You know, Africa, in most of our countries, there is no policy. There is no regulation now. And we, if you analyze the process now about open access, the author, the authors of paper, they have to pay to make the work a freely uh, accessible, open, but to be, it's very expensive. You know, for some journals, you have to pay up to 9,000 euros for your paper to appear. And most our universities are not <laughs> give such kind of money. So I think to, tomorrow we will detail more about open access and then I will give uh, more example and explain the criteria. Who would take the second question? I don't know, maybe on the, I mean, yeah, on the second question, I think um, we need to become more strategic in using science and technology, the diplomatic toolkit. It's definitely one of the tools that should be there. And, and of course, we all know these examples from, from Sesame to um, working together on uh, water management in the Jordan Valley to, to Arctic uh, research and so on, um, where we're using, of course, uh, this, this already, but it's still isolated cases. But I think what we really need to get to is how actually, especially when it comes to the difficult countries, so to speak, we can use it much more strategically. And I give you one interesting um, fact here. And that is, uh, if you look at the EU delegation in Moscow, most of the diplomats have been expelled by Russia. The Research Council is still there. Because obviously, there's a feeling actually in such a situation in the Research Council is, is very important to have. Because science is still, scientists are still talking to each other, even of course, we have, of course, all the sanctions and the universities saying we are not working with that university and so on. But of course, people, people to people connection between scientists are still there. 
Any other comments or another view, Peter, maybe on this? I'm not sure about this last question, but maybe I'll go back to the, the question about the who are the academies. Um, um, I, I think the, you know, the academies do give a certain um, quality control within the, any particular science advice they might be able to give. You know, that it's not coming through an individual scientist. We've seen, you know, with climate change, with, even with COVID, many, many high level scientists sort of speaking out on, on their own um, and perhaps um let, let say they are in, in the minority but they they have a strong voice but they're in the minority against scientific opinion i i think having the academies as a sort of vetting organization and providing synthesis uh, allows a more credible um, presentation of, of the scientific evidence um they have been regarded as elite societies if you like um we did a study a couple of years ago um they are still very male dominated um things are changing but changing very slowly um but there are, are sort of and we are certainly pushing from iap as the sort of global hub um pushing academies to change to and you know engage with more women in the in their leadership in the prize schemes and so on um but also di diversify the the voices coming into their reports and, and in fact our conference this year we have a conference every three years is exactly on the topic of inclusivity so we're sort of really bringing that issue into the academies so we we hope the academies are evolving with the you know uh, as the evolves and um, the academies have a bit of catching up to do but I do think they remain the sort of credible institutions um, that bring the best of science um, through a, a sort of internal peer review mechanism to the public and to the policymaker. Thank you. And Peter, let's not forget, obviously, we also have the Global Young Academy and many national young academies. And they are increasingly engaging also in science advice and science diplomacy because very important to have the, the voices of the young people on board as well. But in fact, this meeting I just mentioned will be the first one between the IAP's senior academies, we call them, and the worldwide meeting of the young academies. So we are putting the two together this time. We have time. We have a couple of minutes just for last uh, short question. No, sit down. Ah. Are you two of you, two people who want to ask a question? Okay. Did you raise your hand? Yeah. Okay, very short, very brief, please. Uh, I just wanted to ask a question to be too late. Okay. Uh, no. uh, I just wanted to ask a question. Uh, did you want to see the people's uh, cooperation and vice versa? But how could you balance uh, this diplomacy between uh, full cooperation and the uh, proper diplomacy of the states uh, in this uh, diplomacy uh, domain? We'll take now the second and last question. Thank you very much uh, for, the, for the last question. I mean, my first reaction was just to point out that you know, for open access, there are different ways to do it. It's not just having to pay for it, but there are other models as well. Just comment on that. And the question would be, uh, the African Union was mentioned a bit of a side note. Uh, do you see uh, 
the science diplomacy also be uh, maybe a potential future activity for the African Union? Of course, African Union is connected with uh, African Academy of Science, and they have uh, a attaché scientific scientific advisors. There is a whole commission devoted to science in African Union. Could you answer the first question? I, I can say something about the first one. I mean, okay. we, are, we are entering a phase of which some call now the post naive science diplomacy. We need to recognize obviously the world is nice out there, there's a real politic out there. And let's face it, I mean, the ultimate goal of, of uh, science diplomacy is to advance diplomatic objectives. And of course, there are Yes, we have global objectives like the SDGs and climate change and so on, but, but of course, we have also national objectives. And that's something, that's the reality we have to deal with. By the, same, by the way, also here in Europe, I mean, we are talking about now strategic autonomy and technological sovereignty in Europe. And of course, we're using science diplomacy for it. And, and of course, that has to do with, with global competition. So it's something I actually, which is, which actually isn't, isn't new. I mean, think of the space race in the 1960s. So, so it has always been there. Uh, but it's something that we need to deal with, that, that of course there are political interests. And, and we as scientists, of course, we provide evidence, um, but we need to be aware, yes, there are of course political interests for which uh, this is going to be used. We understand that science diplomacy uh, is changing or has to change. Our view of science diplomacy has to change because of the crisis that you mentioned. Um, I think we would need another round table for this topic. <laughs> Unfortunately, we do not have time for this now. So I would like to thank each of you uh, for the great inputs. And uh, we have to finish now, I think, to go on in the program. Thank you very much.